On behalf of our team at HBK, I would like to welcome you to Economic Update, Labor, Commodity Prices, and Other Impacts on Manufacturers with HBK Manufacturing Solutions and special guests, Joe Woodall and Tim Quinlan from Wells Fargo. Our session is scheduled for 60 minutes and is being recorded. Please note that all attendees are set up in listen-only mode. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If you would like to submit a question to our panel, please use the question box in the GoToWebinar control bar. In order for participants to earn one CPE credit, you must be present for the full scheduled time and answer all of the designated poll questions. A copy of the recording and presentation will be emailed to you tomorrow. Information is changing daily, and we encourage you to visit our website, hbkcpa.com, for the latest news and commentary. At this time, I'll turn it over to Jim DeCenzo. Thanks, Lori. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim DeCenzo. I am the principal of HBK and the national director of HBK Manufacturing Solutions. And I would like to welcome all of you to our uh, September 2021 presentation of uh, HBK, from HBK Manufacturing Solutions. And this month we have a couple of special guests that agreed to uh, participate, and that is Joe Woodall and Tim Quinlan from Wells Fargo. Uh, Joe is a is a commercial banker who we do a lot of work with here in. Uh, the Northeast Ohio market, and in our quest to find topics that we thought would be interesting and, and relevant and, and different to our manufacturing solutions uh, group, uh, Joe suggested Tim Quinlan and, and the topics that, that, that are chosen today. So I think it'll be a really interesting topic, very timely and um, hopefully helpful to everybody. So again, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Woodall and he will he will um, introduce Tim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks, Amy, and, and, and thank you, HBK, for uh, giving us the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. Uh, again, my name's Joe Woodall, and uh, like Jim said, I'm a relationship with a uh, manager with Wells Fargo here been with the bank for uh, for almost five years and in the industry about 20. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Wells Fargo Commercial Banking has been in Ohio and the market for about 20 years. We have five regional credit branches in Ohio, which are in Cleveland, Akron, Columbus, Dayton, and Cincinnati. Uh, I, I uh, happen to cover the northern portion of the markets, which uh, would include Youngstown, Warren, Akron, Canton, Cleveland, and the Toledo Finley market. So, uh, we have uh, local teams, full-service commercial bank, providing uh, senior debt financing, treasury management, uh, equipment financing, investment banking, and any services uh, that, that typically commercial bank clients need. Um, you know, in northern Ohio, um, as you can imagine, we work a lot with manufacturing clients, and uh, we really enjoy this space. Uh, manufacturing makes up just about 50% of our entire client base. Uh, you know, with some other industries like metals, transportation, and distribution making up other large percentages. So, uh, again, uh, on behalf of Wells Fargo, we, we thank HBK for the opportunity to continue to partner with, um, with a great firm. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Tim Quinlan. Uh, Tim is a managing director, and he's a senior economist here with Wells Fargo Securities. Uh, Tim originally hails from uh, from the great city of Buffalo, New York, but now is based in uh, in warmer climates down in Charlotte, North Carolina. He uh, he provides analysis on the macro U.S. economy and major foreign economies. Uh, Tim's work is is regularly published in academic uh, economic journals, and his comments on uh, the economy regularly appear uh, in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and USA Today. He's also a frequent guest on CNBC and National Public Radio. Tim's been with the bank for for just about 40 years, or around or 40, just about 20 years. Sorry, Tim. Um, so, uh, so with that, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, didn't mean to age you 20 years there, but uh, I'll turn it over to you. You can take it from there. 
<laughs> thanks. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, I appreciate it. And thanks, Jim, for the introduction and, and for the chance to uh, to be here with everybody today. Um, you know, I, I know some of you may be just dialing in for the CPE credits, but we'll try to we'll try to make it um, give you your full money's worth and, and make it an interesting hour here. Um, we do have some uh, prepared materials to go over, and uh, Joe was able to email me with some of the questions that you submitted last night. And um, you know, the, the deck that you're going to see here um, was kind of created before I had those questions, but. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, just about all of them we we get to um, throughout the course of the the prepared content here. And I guess you know one thing I'd say just to try to keep things interesting is um, you know please feel free to use that um, submit a question feature uh, if there's anything that I kind of go by too quickly or or something that you want um, further detail on um, you know. I think people always kind of pay attention in the first few minutes, and then it's it's not it's not uncommon to zone out a little bit, and then clue back in again for the for the Q and A. So um, I'll I'll be ready to uh, address your questions there, and and my prepared stuff might only get us to around you know say 40 minutes past the hour or so. So I'm I'm, I'm semi banking on uh, a few questions from you guys to to help uh, make this a a more interactive uh, session. So with all that. Said, um, we're let's look at slide five here, which begins with kind of U.S. GDP, and I guess and the way to think of this is, yeah. Before we jump in, we got to give everybody a chance to answer our first poll question. Oh, okay. Let me just leave that up for a couple seconds and get everybody a chance to respond if they need CPE credits. And I, I can't tell if that's Amy or Lori's voice right now. It's Lori. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So will you, will you need to uh, should I just pause at various points as we make our way through? Yeah, I'll let you know when we have. We just have to kind of give a check in for everybody okay. and let them um, answer the poll questions, and then I'll let you yep. know when we've got a good portion. Okay. In. So we have eighty percent in. <clears throat> Give everybody a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it out. Let's see if we, uh, looks like the screen isn't advancing. Let's see. I think we're stuck on our CPE credit question. Okay. Well, I can I can fill the air for a minute as we as we wait yeah. for that to fix. By I'll, I'll just say to everybody, um, you know, if, for what it's worth, I don't know. I'm not quite sure why, but but Joe and I are both kind of semi blocked from using the the go to webinar features. I don't somebody somebody at the bank IT department apparently thinks that we'll, we'll be under attack if we use go to webinar. So. Um, if, if, it, if it feels like I'm a, a page off or something, Lori, if I'm not adjusting for a an inserted question or something, um, just, just let me know because I'm not necessarily looking. Although I know what the each slide says on it, I'm not looking at the live version of the of the screen that you guys are. So just let me know if I'm off. All right, we're all set. We're, go ahead. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So um, so hopefully now everybody's looking at um, kind of two charts of, of GDP. The the compound, compound annualized growth rate on the left in kind of the level terms on, on the right-hand side. And, you know, I think the way to kind of think of this is, you know, if we were to roll the clock back just a few months to the end of June, beginning of July, at that point, we were pretty bulled up. We had um, a, a more enthusiastic outlook than we have now. Um, we have since then kind of dialed back our full year forecast, but but you know to be sure it's still really strong. So we're looking at uh, full year growth of 5.9 percent this year, and then you can kind of see um, in the chart on the next page, which gives you kind of full year GDP figures. Um, you know that would, if realized, that it put us to the strongest full year economic growth since the early 1980s. But that's very very good. Uh, but but prior to this kind of you know, I don't want to call it like a deterioration as those things are, are, are really coming unglued here, but it's just not quite as great as it might have been had we not had this um, COVID backdrop. And, and and so just a few months ago, our forecast was the strongest growth since the 1950s. That's kind of 
um, pulled back here a little bit in in the wake of um, you know the the rising case counts and some of the new measures to restrict the growth of the virus and that sort of thing. Um, and that's and you know e even if things were going fine, um, I, I suppose I would temper that that outlook by saying you know just because we've got this really really strong growth. It, it's not necessarily fully sustainable and fully organic, and some of the growth that we've got comes with some kind of growing pains around it. So if we flip forward to slide seven, so there should be personal income. So we've got real disposable personal income along with our forecast for it. And what you kind of see here is, you know, from 2016 to 2019, kind of, you know, flattish, steady, steady as she goes sort of growth. And then from now through till the end of 2023, more of that kind of steady as she goes kind of growth. But then during the pandemic, it, you know, it looks like it's been a great time for, for personal income growth. And I think we all know it, it's been anything but a great time for, for a lot of people. And what that's really reflecting, you can kind of see three surges in the data there. And, you know, the first one that occurred right after the pandemic began, that's the, the CARES Act and the various measures to to get the first round of stimulus dollars out there. Um, the second two spikes respectively are the, the December COVID relief bill passed during the, the lame duck session, and then the um, American Rescue Plan uh, passed in the, in the early days of, of the Biden presidency. And, and then the, the extent to which it, it, it's higher in general beyond that is just other factors like child tax credits, um, additional jobless benefits, those sorts of things. So the point here is to say, a lot of this stuff sort of comes from, you know, big uh, government transfer payments, not necessarily really robust personal income growth. And, you know, what, what that has um, kind of ushered in, among other things, is a really strong um, savings backdrop. So if we flip forward to slide eight here, you can kind of see the personal saving rate. I backed this all the way up. You know, we're going back, you know, um, you know, 60 years here, going back to the, the early 1960s. And uh, what you can kind of tell is just an unprecedented um, pickup in savings. And it's not because we suddenly found religion during this period. This is kind of a, um, a forced thrift. In other words, with households not able to spend on services during, um, you know, certainly during the early phases of this thing, but even to a lesser extent more recently, some of the services spending has been held back by COVID concerns. That's kind of led to what we refer to as kind of this excess savings. And if you add up the amount that this um, savings that we've, you know, occurred over, that's kind of above and beyond what the pre-pandemic level would be, what you kind of find here is, is north of $2 trillion in excess savings. Now, you know, that is has scope to continue to underpin um, consumer spending going forward, but it's actually already been a, a strong backdrop for consumer spending. What we're really relying on now is kind of a pivot to the services sector. So take a look at, at slide nine, which we call at your service. Uh, this kind of breaks out consumer spending by its various um, components. So durable goods spending has just been incredibly strong. You know, through um, through the second quarter of this year, overall durable you know, with people kind of, you know, locked up at home and, and you know, not able to go on vacation or send the kids to camp or do the sorts of things that they might have done in other periods, there was a real surge in um, durable spending. So this is, you know, a classic example of durable goods would be a, a automobile or um, appliances or snowmobiles, anything that's kind of meant to last at least a few years. And that's been very, very strong. And you probably already see the services line is not yet quite back to its pre-pandemic peak. And services is um, kind of, you know, if you add up durable goods and non-durable goods, um, those, those two combined are only about half as big as services. Services is a much larger share of spending. And that is what still has some scope here to get back to um, its pre-pandemic peak. And we do expect that to happen, uh, but you know, obviously we're, we're kind of hitting a, a, a sauce patch in, in that spending. So if you look at our, our forecast on slide 10, you know, coming off a really strong figure in the second quarter, you know, we were, you know, consumer spending grew at an 11.9% annualized rate in Q2. You know, we've only had back-to-back double-digit quarters um, you know, you've got to go back to the 1950s to find another period 
where consumer spending has been as strong as it already has been throughout this recovery. And so you know, that kind of comes off the boil here. In the current quarter, the third quarter, you know, we're really in kind of a, a tough spot. We were, you know, anticipating this, what we, we called it a, a recreation renaissance throughout the summer months. And we certainly had that going through June to a lesser extent through July. And then, you know, in August and September, it's kind of petered out here a little bit as people have kind of had renewed concerns about the virus. Now, that's already occurring against the backdrop of a uh, retrenchment in durable goods spending. We, we were expecting that all along. We, we, we thought that some of that demand was pulled forward. In other words, you know, the, some of the spending on goods that we saw over the last year was, you know, you know people that were, were, were buying stuff because there's just no other place to put that money and that would ultimately stand in the way of stronger growth in, in durable goods spending in, in the years to come. And, and so that the softness we're seeing there is not a huge surprise. It's just not being offset as much by services spending as we had kind of um, been hoping for. So now when you look at our forecast there, what you kind of see is a little bit of a pickup in the first and second quarter of next year. And we're not trying to be too cute here with that. Um, essentially, and we kind of we we put this in the words of our latest monthly outlook. We we sort of said, you know, at some point, you know, these worries about the pandemic will abate a little bit. You know, people who have some vaccine hesitancy are, you know, either because they now know people who have gotten the Delta variant, or they themselves have gotten it, or because of the, you know, um, maybe their their company is requiring to get it. We're seeing some of that hesitancy to get the vaccine sort of melting away. Well, at the same time, you know, just the, the regular pattern of, you know, enough people getting it and, and building some natural immunity. So at some point, the, 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 the virus concerns themselves will abate. And when that happens, there, you know, that, that eventual surge in services will happen. We've got that sort of penciled in for the first and second quarter of next year. You know, I'm not a sorcerer. I have no idea exactly when this stuff is going to happen. You know, by putting it in the first and second quarter, we're simply saying that at some point there will be kind of a, a bulge for a couple of quarters in, in the overall rate of, of services spending. And then it'll kind of get back to something closer to trend sort of growth, which I'd say is you know, between two and a half and three percent. And that's kind of what um, you've got through the rest of the of the forecast period. But obviously, we're we're here today to think of this in the context of what all this means for manufacturing, um, what it means for you know output at, at the nation's factories, and 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 that's a, a as good a, a point as any to to pivot to to that part of the discussion. So let's get to to slide eleven here, which looks at core capital goods spending. So if you said to, to any economist in, in just about any country in the world, you'd say, hey, what is, what's your outlook for manufacturing? What's your outlook for equipment spending in your economy? You know, the, the security blanket that we would all you know, immediately be, be clutching to, to kind of inform our forecast would be some measure of core capital goods spending. So when I say core, it means you know, we're going to strip away defense spending. We don't want to capture you know, big government outlays on, on, on the defense sector. And we don't want um, even even civilian aircraft orders, because you know if if Boeing has you know a half dozen 787 Dreamliners, it's so big it, it it kind of throws the numbers out of whack. So we we exclude those from it, and that leaves you what you kind of see here with core capital goods. And and now you can kind of look at that yourself and say how good is this as a leading indicator for manufacturing, and you know where are we in this current cycle? And you know so if you, if I were to kind of tell you what I see when I look at that is, you know, in the in the 2002 to 2008 cycle, it took almost all of that cycle for us to get back to our pre-pandemic or pre-recession peak, I should say, for that cycle. And then the kind of the financial crisis came along at the end of 2007, and things started to fall out of bed in the financial services sector and in the housing market. But you actually had the strength of manufacturing activity continue into the early part of of that recession, it kind of hit a higher number even after the recession started. But then things really fell out of bed when it became clear that but economic activity was, and that really kind of cratered. And then it, it recovered relatively quickly, kind of getting back on its feet by 2012 or so. But what was going on there was 
you know, everything going on with fracking and energy and, you know, oil and natural gas and, and out in the, you know, the, the Permian and the, uh, all, all the stuff out in the Dakotas and stuff, that kind of listed activity. And <clears throat> when oil prices fell out of bed in 2015 and 2016, that mining activity kind of came back down, even as over underlying manufacturing activity remained strong. And we were, then we kind of bumped into the trade war and, and, you know, nobody wants to, you know, staff up or start spending a, a bunch more in the in the waning days of that. And then the, the pandemic itself, of course, comes along and, and we get another dip. But look at what has happened over the last 18 months or so. Just um, just a really, you know, I, you can look at that chart and I can say unprecedented, at least through the 1990s, to see the kind of vertical spike that we've experienced over the last 18 months. So demand has just been very, very strong. Um, unfortunately, we've not yet seen the same thing with industrial production data, the actual output data. So take a look at this chart on slide 12. Now you'll note here that these figures are only through the month of July. Earlier this morning, we just got the August data on this. And it turns out I was I was on deck to write the report for that this morning. So I'm I'm pretty clued in with what just happened in the August data. And here we find um, yet another uh, monthly increase in industrial production. But um, so these numbers come from the Federal Reserve. According to Fed's estimates, the 0.2% increase in manufacturing that we got this morning could have been even stronger. By the Fed's estimates, it could have been a four-tenths of a percent increase had it not been for uh, Hurricane Ida, which kind of idled activity and, and held back overall manufacturing production. Aside from that, mining was down, utilities were up, you know, there's kind of a, um, you know, but but I think the, the broad backdrop here is this dynamic of businesses not being able to get their hands on the input components that they so desperately need. Um, slide 13 uh, kind of looks at the poster child for that, which is the, the auto sector, right? So uh, what you kind of see here is immediately after the pandemic, that red line runs well ahead of the blue line. So the red line is motor vehicles and parts production. That was very, very strong for a while. Uh, but then, you know, with the semiconductor shortages and other problems from suppliers kind of um, getting in the way of, uh, you know, kind of all these bottlenecks in the way of, of production, you kind of see the, the red line break down below the blue line. July was a good month for motor vehicles and parts production. It jumped 9%. The good news for August is it, it didn't fall out of bed completely. It posted a very modest increase in, in August. Um, not, not nearly as strong as it was in the prior month, but, but not falling either. Uh, but just the same uh, manufacturing output in general is doing a little better than, than the auto sector in particular. And, <clears throat> and that is emblematic of some of these um, kind of problems that you're seeing. So when do these supply chain problems go away? That is um, the, the the number one um, question that we've got. In in fact, you know, um, I'm looking at the the questions that Joe sent me in his email last night. And number one is supply chain. Is there any end in sight to this disruption? And then there's three or four different versions of that question, kind of uh, throughout the rest of the questions that he forwarded to me. I have not heard anybody give a satisfactory answer on this. And so I set out to uh, come up with a better one myself. And, you know, what, what we built around this is slide 14. Now, you know, if any of you are kind of armchair economists yourselves, I would say, you know, slide 14 is not an econometric model. There's no, you know, linear regression that proves that any of these variables have any kind of causality with supply chain dynamics. This is just my kind of dashboard of indicators that I use to try to keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening here. And then I've kind of done a regular, you know, street stoplight, you know, convention here, red light, yellow light, green light, go. Um, and what you can kind of tell from my output here at, at just a glance is, you know, things are not only not getting better, uh, they're arguably getting worse. So, you know, we only have September data for a couple of these. We've got June data for everything, July for most, August for some. Let's kind of take a look at what these are telling us. Um, let's start with shipping. So look at the, the price measures, which is the middle block there. Um, you know, I, I won't go through every single line in the, in the pressure gauge here, but, but take a look at the world container index. And then a subcomponent of the world container index, the Shanghai to Los Angeles rate. So if you are 
you know, moving, you know, one of these 30 foot equivalent units, one of these big containers on a freighter from Shanghai to Los Angeles. Back in February, that would have cost you about 1500 bucks for a, for a full um, uh, container. Through September, that cost has risen to $11,500. That is, that is emblematic of the, 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 the price dynamics that are just so much stronger than, you know, the Fed keeps talking about transitory pricing. And you see this in steel prices as well. You see it really, you know, across the board. But, um, you know, the, just the cost of moving this stuff is, um, you know, really, really through the roof. Um, if you look at um, the year over year change of the, the dry van rate per mile, now, here, here, this is a little bit better. Yes, it's elevated. It's up 20% versus a year ago. But, you know, back in May, it was up 70% versus a year ago. Now, I'll grant you it's a moving target with your year ago price comparisons. And to some extent, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to see those year over year numbers bump into high figures from the prior year, and that alone will bring them down. But, but the point here is, you know, a, a lot of these things are, are, are still in, in a tough spot. And if you ask yourself, well, why is why is shipping to, to Los Angeles a little bit higher than shipping in general? I see that the World Container Index, for example, is only 10,000, uh, whereas Shanghai to Los Angeles is 11,500. Well, look at the last uh, component under my time measures there. This is a tally of ships at anchor off the, the West Coast in Los, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And what you find here is uh, the log jam and the the lack of workers at the West Coast ports has resulted in more and more of these boats sitting off the coast, unable to get in to get unloaded. And, you know, the, the queue is getting worse in September. Um, you know, you've now got 38 ships out there versus 33 the months prior. You know, all of that is up considerably from, you know, zero ships, um, you know, back in the spring of last year. So uh, we're, we're certainly keeping tabs on all of this stuff. Um, if you don't get our write-ups on it, you can go to wellsfargo.com slash economics email and sign up for our indicator summary. So whenever you get a, a report in the manufacturing sector, like this morning's industrial production report or, you know, the durable goods report, factory orders, um, the ISM surveys, <clears throat> we write all those up and we're including our pressure gauge in it until these pressure um, until these supply chain problems start to abate a little bit, we're going to continue to include that pressure gauge um, in there. So what does all this mean for um, uh, equipment spending? Well, slide 15 is our forecast here. Um, you know, we're, we're going to hit a little bit of a, a soft Ken? patch in the current quarter. Yep. Ken? Is it, is it compliance check-in time? Yeah, we got to do another poll <laughs> real quick. Tim, while we're on that poll question, can you repeat the address to sign up for the Wells Fargo uh, economic impact email? Sure. Yeah, it's um, it's wellsfargo.com and then a, a forward slash, which on my keyboard is the by the question mark. Um, and then at, right after that, economics email, all one word, economics email. So wellsfargo.com slash economics email. And uh, that'll forward you to a link and ask for your name and an email address. And then that forwards you a, a, a sign up link. And you'll get a choice there to say, do you want our regional stuff where we, you know, we do like state payroll data and stuff? Do you want our, our Fed commentary, uh, weekly, the monthly? Um, you know, it, there, there, there's a lot of stuff. You don't want to jam your inbox completely. Um, maybe just sign up for the weekly and the, the uh the indicator analysis but you know certainly whatever looks interesting to you there um please sign up there's no charge or anything for that you're not going to get a, a salesman trying to uh get you to sign up for a mortgage or something it's just it's just a, a source of information for you to kind of keep tabs on the economy okay we're all set and i'll make sure to add that as well to the follow-up email that everyone gets after the session is oh thank over. you mm -hmm. thanks very much 
So if I say slide 15, um, is that still good, or do we have do I need to uh, make an account? For yep. So it's 16 now. Six. So so when I say 16, that's U.S. equipment growth. Is that what you're looking at? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. All right. Great. Okay. So so this is our forecast for equipment spending. This is kind of where capex spending shows up in the GDP accounts. It's almost it's almost certain not to look as smooth as I've got it in here right now. Um, the quarterly decline that you see there in Q3 is just a function of, uh, you know, with because of these supply chain dynamics, there's it's going to be um, tough to, to have a positive number in the third quarter. Beyond that, we've got kind of steady above trend growth in equipment spending. Um, but that's kind of predicated on things eventually getting better with the um, with the supply chain problems. And you know, if, if I had a chance to do this forecast over right this minute, I might fade to the, the first quarter of next year, um, the fourth quarter and of this year and the first quarter of next year just a little bit to acknowledge the fact that things haven't haven't really improved meaningfully yet. But it's not it's not a function of there not being enough demand out there. I guess. If I were to just put this in layman's terms, it's you, you wait you wait decades for for a demand environment like this, and and it's so frustrating because it finally comes along and you can't get your hands on the input components that you need or hire the workers to 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 make the stuff that you're trying to produce. And you know I think that in in in, in plain English is the, the problem that a lot of these manufacturers are facing right now. And so, you know, when I when when I try to forecast equipment spending, I know what the, the demand backdrop is. People would be people would be, you know, increasing their equipment spend hand over fist if they could get their hands on the stuff that they needed. It's it's just a question of of supply chains clearing up. And and you know, I I can I can use economic tools to try to anticipate what the demand backdrop looks like, but I don't have any tools for knowing when the supply chain problems get better other than my, my pressure gauge, which I built. And as soon as that starts flashing green, I'll start getting a little bit more optimistic about the outlook. Um, right, so it's not merely the um, the raw materials, but but also the, the, the workers, right? So let's look at the unemployment rate on slide 16. And here you find, you know, through August, we're still at 5.2%, which is frankly pretty elevated compared to where we were going into this thing. And with all these other measures of economic growth being so strong, why is it that the labor market has not responded more swiftly? And I think I'd point out a couple of things here. One is we have had actually a pretty um, robust snapback. If you compare this cycle to the financial crisis on slide 17, um, the financial crisis is the blue line, and the current cycle is the red line. You know, we're 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 rebounding much more sharply than we did in that cycle. We'll probably be all the way back on our feet by the end of 2023. So, you know, things things are snapping back here, but it still doesn't seem to gel with um, what's otherwise a really strong backdrop for labor. Um, let's let's flip forward a, a, a couple slides here. It's a slide. Um, I'm, I'm, I got to get my numbers right. I think it should be slide 20, which tries to show um, employment in Youngstown. And um, you know, I think the, the the thing to point out here is you know we're more than halfway back in terms of jobs that were lost. So about 62% of the jobs lost during the recession have been kind of um, retraced. But we had a little bit of a soft patch uh, across Youngstown back in the spring, and the unemployment rate at 6.9% is not just above the national average, but it's a little higher than it is um, in Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And if you wonder why I'm kind of putting Pittsburgh and Cleveland in there, you know, it, it, I've got a little bit, um, just because of the availability of labor, um, the availability of data from the labor department, as well as some of the, the regional figures, I'm able to get um, a little bit more data. And, you know, as, as you already know, you're about equidistant between those two MSAs or metropolitan statistical areas. So I kind of reference those at various points throughout this as kind of benchmarks for how Youngstown is doing. When you look at the employment backdrop across the region, though, slide 21 here kind of shows you that employment growth by industry. And what we find here is that almost all of the jobs are in 
you know, it, it technically is mining, logging, construction, but I think we can we can safely conclude that a lot of it is in the construction sector. So as as the the housing sector is kind of uh, catching a little bit of wind here from um, the, the increase in uh, demand for, for new housing. That's kind of driving um, the overall em employment picture. And, you know, manufacturing in Youngstown at 11.4% is a share of the total population. It's a, a, certainly a far, far cry from where it was 25 or 30 years ago when that share of employment was, you know, north of 20%. Uh, but the rest of these industries, uh, relative to where they were before the pandemic, are all still, you know, not way down, but down at least a little bit from from where they were. Um, you know, slide 22 has got some figures on population growth, and you know, you, you don't need an out-of-town economist to point this out. You're probably well aware of the fact that um, you know Youngstown's been, been losing population a little bit each year over the last couple of decades. But I think it's, it's it's a somewhat encouraging development to say that 2020 was not atypical from from trend. You didn't see you know any kind of a big outflow. A lot of other cities saw a worsening in this dynamic, and that that was not the case um, in, in Youngstown. You can look, for example, at, at, at Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and to varying degrees there, they saw uh, a little bit of a uh, an, an increase in the outflows. Um, in, in the most recent figures there. Um, that's on slide 23. Um, when you look at, at what's happening in the housing data, and again, I apologize, I don't have, um, there's just simply not, Commerce Department doesn't have um, great data on this um, for Youngstown, but on slide 24, I've got housing permits for both Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and these act as kind of leading indicators for where things are headed. And certainly an uptrend in kind of the post-pandemic period, uh, both in Cleveland and in Pittsburgh, you're seeing, you know, single family starts um, rising to their highest level of the last 10 years or so. So, well, well, certainly last 10 years in Cleveland, the last six or seven years in the case of Pittsburgh. But the point there being that um, construction activity is ramping back up a little bit. You know, the the, the headwinds that we, we, we face in, in all of this thing is this backdrop of rising prices. And you can see that, you know, we talked about the supply challenges earlier, uh, but that shows up in prices on slide 25 as well. So, you know, you, the, the Fed talks about, you know, targeting inflation. Yep. Sorry, I got to pause you one more time. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Everybody get their credits in. All right, looks like we're good. I'm going to close the poll. And all right. All right. Track. Oh, okay. So if I say supply challenges, U.S. producer price index input costs, is that now slide 26? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Um, okay. So, so the Fed talks about inflation being, you know, well, we're, you know, our target is 2%, and so we're overshooting that a little bit now, but, you know, we're trying to have average inflation growth of 2%, so it's okay to overshoot it here for a little bit. And I think you talk to most people in the manufacturing sector, and they say, you know, 2%, 3 4%, what are you talking about? When I look at, at unprocessed intermediate goods in the producer price index, that's up 54% from last year. You know, you guys are crazy talking about 5%. You know, I'm not, I don't favor the position of defending the Fed, but they're trying to say how much prices are increasing for consumers. And it is a, it is a painful truth that for manufacturers, prices are rising much, much faster than they are for consumers. The, the good news is that to varying degrees, uh, businesses are able to kind of pass some of these prices on. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge um, you know, against all of this is when you think of it in the context of the labor market, you know, so we, we, we talked about jobs before and job growth being weak. You know, part of the problem is people can't fill the positions that they've got open. So slide 27 shows you on the left-hand side, um, you've got the, 
The blue line on the left is the NFIB, that stands for National Federation of Independent Business. It's a survey of small businesses. And you ask these folks, hey, you know, what do you think about the job market these days? Is it e easy to fill these positions or is it tough? And they say it is harder to fill jobs right now than it's been at any point going all the way back to the mid-1990s. It's a very, very difficult time. At least half of employers say they can't find the people that they need. Meanwhile, that red line shows you the participation rate of prime age workers is about as low as it's been at any point in the last 20 years. So we're we're trying to figure out ways to encourage more participation in the labor force. And there are you know, a lot of things kind of standing in the way of that. The most obvious one, of course, being, you know, generous jobless benefits. Now that now that the additional jobless benefits have rolled off in September, perhaps that impediment will go away. But you've still got, uh, you know, worries about COVID, uh, the lack of availability of getting decent um, or affordable daycare for kids with, you know, the, the COVID situation has really upended daycare, as anybody, any working parents can tell you, after school programs, et cetera, that all kind of creates a, a really tough problem. But, you know, whether you are um, asking businesses or consumers, so look at the chart on the right-hand side, the red line there is jobs plentiful. That comes from the, the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Survey. We'll get fresh figures on this report on Friday of this week. But if you look at the jobs plentiful measure, you know, 54.6% of consumers say the jobs are more plentiful now, which is, as you can see from the chart, about as high as it's been at any point going back to the early 2000s. So both businesses, businesses say jobs are hard to fill. Consumers say the jobs are plentiful. So it's not a, it's not a demand problem. It's a supply problem. It's just trying to, to match people with um, the jobs that are out there and, and kind of overcoming the objections they've got um, to working. But when you think about costs for employers, um, slide 28 kind of breaks this down. You know, the, you know, among other things, yes, you're paying more for raw materials, but you're paying more for workers as well. And, you know, the right hand side kind of ranks where you're seeing the biggest growth in average hourly earnings by industry. And it kind of starts with the, the leisure and hospitality sector and then transportation and warehousing. Uh, you're trying to find truckers, bus drivers, any anything with a driving component is a very um, difficult thing to do these days, and that's contributing to it. But but there is no industry out there where you're seeing average hourly earnings um, sinking right now. Wages are, are really growing um, across the board regardless of industry. It's just a question of where they're growing the fastest. So we bring it back from, from the producer side of things to the consumer side of things. On slide 27, you can kind of see the, the contributions to the various um, components of the CPI index. We just got the latest um, uh, August figures for CPI yesterday. Uh, not, not quite as strong as it was in July, but, but still coming in quite strong by historical standards. Uh, you know, the, the core rate of CPI inflation is about as strong as it's been at any point in the last 20 years or so. And this is, um, in my view, one of the biggest uh, headwinds for, for economic growth and, and could eventually be perceived as a little bit of a, you know, maybe a miscalculation on the part of the Fed for not fully appreciating how much this stuff is impacting consumer sentiments and, you know, consumer expectations. As a case in point, look at slide 30, which has got um, consumer inflation expectations, the blue line there, uh, consumers are seeing inflation rising faster than they have at any point since when we had the uh, gas prices spike in the middle of the recession back in 2008. Um, right. So, you know, what's our outlook for inflation? Well, slide 31 has our forecast. Uh, we have about the highest forecast on the street in terms of where we think things are going from here. We're looking for um, the PCE deflator, the Fed's preferred measure, yes, it does come off a little bit. So we at least agree partly with the Fed that the inflation dynamics are transitory. But even by the end of our forecast period in 2023, both headline and core inflation will be well above the Fed's target rate of 2%. So, uh, you know, our expectation is that this remains a kind of a big problem. So, um, you know, think about any questions that you've got here as I, as I kind of wrap this stuff up. Uh, you know, one thing to kind of think about in all of this is all of the various 
fiscal policy plans. And I'm not a I'm not a guru on what Congress is going to do, but um, you know, people always ask economists where things are headed. So here's here's my best stab at it. Um, here's kind of where we are with the legislative timeline on slide 32. Uh, you know, the we we've technically got a budget resolution, but you know, we've got a long way to go for that to be passed. And Democrats and Republicans are playing yet another game of chicken with this. And, you know, our best guess here is that the reconcilia reconciliation bill will end up containing a, a more modest increase in new spending over the next decade. And, you know, they'll probably only figure out a way to pay for about half of it with higher revenue. By higher revenue, of course, I mean tax increases. And uh, the Democrats just released their latest proposals for what those tax increases will look like um, the day before yesterday or you know, actually in the early morning hours of yesterday. So um, still kind of getting our arms around that. And they're just proposals at this stage of the game. But if you kind of think about what's at, on offer here, slide 33 kind of breaks out the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act. So that's call it about a half a trillion dollars. And that's spread across the board for mostly, you know, the more traditional infrastructure stuff. Yes, there's a little bit of solar stuff in there, but it's no longer the the wish list for Democrats that it was before. They've really got something closer to a compromise there. So does that boost the economy? Not as much as you might think. So slide 34 kind of shows you how um, federal investment spending takes a few years before it trickles into the economy. Um, I, I like infrastructure spending better than just handouts in the form of, you know, checks to individual households. Um, I think that it does more to actually boost economic growth over time. But you know, if you want an immediate effect, there's nothing quite like that sugar high of giving consumers a check and watching them spend it. That usually has a more immediate effect. Infrastructure programs take a little bit longer um, to fan out. Um, you know, the, the, the next couple of slides break out both the jobs plan and the families plan. You know, they're they're still kind of hashing all of this stuff out. This these these charts are really intended just to kind of give you an idea yeah. of the, the scope and, and, and what's, oh, I'll check in time? Yes, last one. This is the last one. I okay. <laughs> I won't interrupt you anymore until it's question time. That's okay. All right, looks like everybody's uh, got their votes in. So we're on the American Jobs Plan chart on page 36. Is that right, or did you want to go up to the next one? Yeah, let's let's flip up to the one that says how to pay for it, which I'm guessing that's going to be 38 now. Is that right? Yep, 38. Okay. All right. So so you know where where are you going to get the money? You got all these all these uh, pie in the sky ideas of of new stimulus that's coming in the heels of already huge stimulus that we had last year. So where, how are you going to pay for this stuff? So here are you know some of the main proposals that they've talked about. One is raising the corporate income tax. The other is uh, to double the GILTI tax rate, impose it on a country by country basis, and eliminate the exemption for deemed returns. There's the, um, what about the 15% corporate minimum tax on book income? So these are just some of the various policy proposals that are thrown out there. And what you've got here is three different independent groups kind of scoring those various proposals and how much money it gives you. And, you know, long story short, there's about a trillion dollars worth of money there, which means you know, they're probably going to have to come at us another way to, to try to raise some of that revenue. Um, you know, the, you know the, the expectation is that corporate tax rates certainly go up. You can see that on slide 39. You know, beyond that, I'm not sure what else they're going to get away with. You're coming into an election year now that makes it tough to raise taxes. You know, one of the things that Democrats put in their proposals the night before last was a uh, a three percent surcharge on anybody making more than five million dollars. That's kind of a um, standard playbook tool to to get big dollars. Uh, they can kind of put that out there, and then if if Republicans squawk, they can say, okay, well, forget it. We won't do that, but don't blame us when it grows the de deficit. It's kind of a um, you sort of see these 
kind of tricks every time from both sides. And I'm not, I'm not laying the blame on one side or the other here. They, they both kind of do it. But, um, you know, the, the, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, the, the takeaway here is that, you know, we've got a lot of big ambitious things that we want to do. And, you know, unless you want to pay more in taxes, we don't have the money to do it. And that means, you know, we run bigger budget deficits. Let's look at slide. I'm hoping this is slide 40, the federal budget deficit in debt. Yep. And so on the left-hand side, okay, thank you. So on the left-hand side, you've got um, the federal budget deficit. So this is, you know, we kind of say it's a roller coaster ride, but what it really shows is that during periods of expansion, so remember wherever you see those vertical gray bars, those are recessions. So expansions of the periods in between. And during the expansions, we have a tendency to chip away at the budget deficit and narrow the budget deficit. So in other words, we're, we're doing a better job at living within our means. And then recessions come along and they mess things up. And what I would point out is that around 2015, in the prior cycle, we kind of gave up on our usual pattern. You know, look at the 1990s versus the last cycle. By the end of the 90s, we were we were running a budget surplus. By all means, we should have been doing the same thing in this last cycle, but you know, we had tax cuts and spending increases at the same time. And you know, the inevitable result of that is we ran bigger budget deficits. When Republicans and Democrats have a fight and they both come away from it happy, we should all be worried about that. So we went into the recession with already elevated levels of budget deficits, and that just got much, much worse as we had to kind of do all these emergency measures to get us through. And so the the you know, so the deficit is just your ongoing you know annual um, you know how much are your on a flow basis how much are your expenses um, outstripping your 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 income. The right hand side is the accumulated tally with the total debt. And you know, as you can see here, this goes all the way back to the 1790s. And it's kind of a scary chart. We're running, you know, almost record high levels, only at the height of the Second World War during the Marshall Plan and uh the Truman Doctrine and all the spending to rebuild Europe after the war. Did we ever see the debt held by the public larger as a share of GDP than it is today? So that sort of concludes my, my formal remarks here. The next slide has some risks to the upside and risks to the downside. Um, I can see we're about 54 minutes um, into the hour here. So maybe this is as good a time as any to see what um, questions we might have accrued along the way. Yeah, Tim, thanks so much. That was lots of information for our attendees. So. Um, I do. We have time for just uh, one question, but if anyone has uh, other questions, feel free to submit them. Um, response to the email is fine, and we'll get somebody to respond back to you. So the question I have is, uh, with recent tax increase announcements, should manufacturers take any actions to prepare? Well, you know, it's it's, it's kind of tough. I mean, I, I think what, what I, if I read into that question a little bit, it might be, you know, okay, so we've got higher input costs. We can't get our hands on the input components that we need. We can't find qualified people to hire. And now we're going to have higher taxes. Uh, what else, what else, what else can we possibly heap onto this thing? And, you know, I, what else can you do to prepare? I guess the, the challenge right now, and, you know, this is, this is what, you know, any discussion that I have with a manufacturer kind of boils down to this right now. And, and the question is, do I pay up? You know, is, is this a time when, you know, is, 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 it, is, it, is it smart for me to pay a lot more for input components? My ordinary suppliers don't have the stuff that I need. I can find people who do, but they're gouging me. They want a lot of money for it. And I can, you know, through regular, regular hiring programs, I can't find people to even show up for an interview. Um, I guess I can start paying more, but then I risk paying the new people more than my good experienced people are already making. Or I've got to raise the wages for the people that I've got in order to not lose them and have them go down the street to somebody else. And it's a tough, tough spot. And the fact of the matter is, if you don't, your competitors will. So, you know, you, you don't want to get locked into long-term pricing contracts and long-term, you know, payment situations. You don't want to sign a, a five-year contract with somebody for what they're going to get paid. But, you know, it's kind of, it takes a little bit of courage right now to to, to pay up and staff up and, you know, acquire the, the input components that you need and just hope that you've got the pricing power to pass on those higher prices. So, 
you know, beyond that, I'm not sure how you prepare for higher taxes other than, you know, vote for somebody who's not going to raise your taxes. But, um, you know, it's a, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's an inevitable outcome, but, you know, as I say, we're, you know, believe it or not, 2022 is an election year again, and it's easier to raise the corporate tax than it is to raise the personal tax and get reelected. So, um, you know, I'm, there's no sure bets in any of this stuff, but but I think they're certainly going to be coming after you with a higher corporate tax rate. And, you know, the, whatever you see as the most appropriate way to prepare for that, um, I think is, is likely warranted. And with that, I'll, I'll just say to uh, Jim, Amy, and Lori, uh, on behalf of both Joe and myself and all of our pals here at Wells Fargo, um, thanks for the chance to, to be with you today and to, to share our thoughts on this stuff. Tim, thank you. Wonderful. A uh, lot of great information there, a lot to process and, and a lot to think about. And the question that came in at the end is a, is, is a question that we've heard so much in the last year. What what could we do from a tax? What should we do from a tax standpoint? And suffice to say, we are watching this very closely. And what I could recommend is uh, keep in touch with us contact us with questions, contact us with with any question, uh, and any consulting that you may need, and we are watching closely as any tax bills are introduced and as they move through uh, the process, so uh, but a very timely question. So once again, I'd like to thank both Tim and Joe and um, look forward to seeing each of you and many others a month from now when our topic will be a valuation of privately owned companies, specifically manufacturers, with a, with a presenter from HBK Valuation Group. So once again, thank you for attending and hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye.